I guess, at least here in California, it's afternoon. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about um, standards and uh, how they support the hardware software interface. Uh, my name is Richard Weber. I'm the uh, founder CEO of Semaphore Incorporated. And uh, over the years, I've spent quite a bit of time working on standards committees. And so I'm involved with uh, some of the committees here. So let me go right into the uh, presentation. Uh, first, I'll talk about what is the hardware software interface and, and, and why does it matter? So first of all, most digital devices have some number of registers that the device driver interacts with. And these registers are a very important piece of information for the entire organization. Um, certainly the RTL designers and architects need to come up with the design of the registers and specify the behavior. The verification team needs to use those registers to verify uh, the rest of the design. Um, at some point, somebody's gonna be writing a device driver that will interact directly with, with the, uh, the registers to, to make the device actually work. Um, and if you're in a business of selling chips, or even if you write like uh, really good looking internal documents, there's probably a technical publishing flow associated with the registers as well. So the hardware software interface, and we'll abbreviate it HSI, um, is a very important uh, nexus of information for, for a digital design organization. So there are several standards out there right now that are sort of interacting with the hardware software interface. Uh, we have IP Exact, System RDL, UVM, and Portable Stimulus. So in, in IP Exact, uh, the current uh, standard, I'm, I'm the co-chair. Um, in UVM, uh, our colleague Jamshid Agahi is the secretary of the UVM committee. Um, I was one of the technical leads in the System RDL committee, and uh, we're also active in the Portable Stimulus committee. So let's, let's talk about these, uh, these standards. So IEEE IP exact 1685. So like I said before, I'm the co-chair of this, uh, this committee. Um, the current published version is, is the 2014 uh, version. Uh, industry adoption, um, I'm very enthusiastic. Uh, this one is actually growing quite a bit. Uh, we're seeing more and more uptake uh, of IP exact. Um, IP vendors actually know what the word IP exact means. I'm very excited about that. Uh, the committee is currently active in uh, coming up with the next version, and we're hoping to publish sometime next year. Uh, this particular standard is uh, very focused on modeling the interconnected interfaces in, in, in the NIP so you could be packaged uh, for delivery between an IP provider, either internal or external, to a, a customer that's uh, assembling a chip and integrating the, the IP. Uh, and so for as far as uh, hardware software interface, and then the interface that it uh, documents is, is the, uh, the address map or the registers of, of the IP. Uh, unfortunately, uh, IP exact itself doesn't model any hardware behavior. Um, the 2014 standard um, has this concept of accessing the nets that represent the registers in, in the design. However, that feature is broken. Um, and unfortunately, even though IP exact is becoming popular, uh, I hate to say this, a lot of folks um, type this, these files in by hand. And in even worse, the IP providers think of this as documentation and the way that the IP world works, documentation is always behind and not exactly what the uh, design that's actually been delivered. So there's a lot of inaccuracies in the IP exact files. Uh, even if they're valid IP exact files, and that even the validity has been, been the challenge. Uh, Accelera System RDL. Um, I, I was involved in System RDL since 2000, as it works its way through Cisco systems, the Nolly systems, uh, the Spirit Consortium initial version in 2009, and then the uh, ver I was also participating in the standard that uh, 2017 version. Um, realistically, this standard is, uh, I guess I would say, uh, sort of uh, stagnant or declining. Our customer base, we do have people that use system RDL. Uh, most of them are transitioning over to CSR spec, our domain specific language for register specification. Um, this particular committee is dormant at this time. So after we published in 2017, we 
basically disbanded. And so, so there's nothing going on right now with uh, system RDL. Now this standard has some strengths. So it actually models the, both the hardware and software behavior of, of the, the hardware software interface. And so you can actually generate RTL off of uh, a system RDL description. Now, in today's world, uh, it has limited scope of, of behaviors. Um, that's why most of our customers have transitioned off of it. And uh, one example comparing it, for instance, to IPExact, it has no information about the slave interface and the ports and how all that works. So there's some um, drawbacks with system RDL. Um, so then uh, IEEE 1800.2 UVM, uh, this, this standard, uh, I guess I, I, I've been involved since uh, sort of the beginning of UVM back in 2008 and 2009, but currently uh, our colleague Jamshita Gavi is the, the secretary of the committee. Uh, this, this particular standard is quite popular in the industry, but uh, I still remember the announcement at Accelerate DVCon where we had 300 people showing up and its acceptance is growing in the industry. Um, the committee is active. Um, our team is actively working on the reference implementation and verifying it. And the next version is actually hopefully being published this, this year. Um, now the strengths are it does provide information for the verification team uh, and, and a model for the registers uh, in the register abstraction layer. Uh, certainly the weakness is, is this, this particular standard is focused solely on verification. And, and doesn't really have any hardware behavior in it other than uh, how the software affects the, the hardware. Okay. Okay, Accelera, the portable stimulus uh, standard. Uh, so we're uh, also active on this committee. Um, this particular standard is, is basically just starting out. Um, couldn't really tell you how many people are actually enthusiastic about using it. Um, the current version is 1.0a, and the, the committee is active um, and uh, working on a, a next version of the standard, hopefully uh, publishing this year as well. Now, the strength of, of uh, portable stimulus is the whole concept of sequences of, well, which, which event, what eventually becomes register reads and writes to configure the design in various different ways and respond to certain events. Now, the 1.A standard has a big, big hole in it in that uh, the, the, the whole concept of what the registers are and how you program them actually is, is sort of an exercise left to the portable stimulus user. Um, it's not actually part of the standard. And uh, I guess I can't really talk about what's happening in the standard until it gets published, but uh, hopefully that's an area that will be addressed. Okay, where standards fall short. Now, so as we, we talked about these standards, you saw that each one has a certain um, specification for a certain area of, of digital design. And, and so there is something missing in every one of these standards and, and uh, uh, none of them basically is the everything standard. So that realistically, as you move from one to the other, you lose information or or information is missing in, in, in the beginning and you can't get it there and you have to enter it some other way. Uh, so that's one big gaping hole. And, and even more subtle than that, the, the data models that they use to represent what an address map in a in device is, is, is subtly different. And uh, that can certainly screw you know, people over. Uh, Semaphore, we, since we're on top of all of these standards, and uh, so it's basically our job to reconcile all of this and you know, basically uh, make sure our, our customer teams can get the information through their flow and, and work with all these different standards. Uh, I, I guess I talk about standards. I definitely have to mention the anti-standard. Unfortunately, um, or I guess depending on your point of view, each one of these standards has an escape. Um, IP exact has vendor extensions, system RDL has user defined properties, UVM has user defined access modes. Um, and all of these things are basically escapes for, I wanna do something that's not in the standard. Um, maybe that's okay for one or two things, but if the vast majority of, of your design and design information is contained in these escapes, 
then one wonders you know, why you're even using the standard in the first place. I, I know your manager probably loves to hear that his organization is uh, adhering to standards. But if you use these escapes, you'll very quickly find out that uh, you can't move the files from one organization to another. And e even worse, if you want to change vendors uh, for processing these files, that won't work out either. So, I mean, it realistically, uh, use those escapes as, as little as possible. Um, now, realistically, there's, there's other options for capturing uh, register information in, in the industry. Uh, I guess I can, uh, should mention at least that for some of the smaller, simpler designs, a lot of folks are still using spreadsheets. Uh, register specs look a lot like endless tables. Uh, spreadsheets are tables, so that seems to be a natural fit. And in our tools work with uh, spreadsheets as well. Uh, but we have uh, have a domain-specific language for capturing hardware software behavior and generating RTL and all the other collateral like verification, technical publishing, and, and documentation. And uh, that's CSR spec. And, and our goal with CSR spec is to be a superset of all the standards and beyond. Uh, so our customers have been gravitating towards that because it's pretty much the only way they can get their the design they want implemented and, and get all that collateral uh, that they need to do all their jobs for the different team members and the different disciplines. So looking to the future. So at this point, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, if there's something that uh, I guess the standards are holding you back, like you can't specify one of some feature of your design, so the standards are blocking you, or somehow the standards are not working well in your design flow and, and there could be some improvement in the standards to uh, make your whole team more productive in some way. So I guess if there's any questions, this would be a good time to ask. So with the CSR spec format, um, I'm curious if you have, uh, like is that the data interchange format for if you do have some sort of special tech pubs requirement or something like that? Is that, I mean, is it like a parsable DSL? Is there something where you can actually get information out of it? Okay, so I'll explain a little bit about uh, CSR spec. So CSR spec is, is yeah, of course, if you're a customer, you get the language reference manual. It's, it's in some sense, uh, that manual looks just like a, a language uh, specification that you know, the IEEE or ISO would publish. And, and so that's, it's a real parsable language. And of course we have a compiler for it. Um, our customers are using their CSR spec source files as, as their golden source, at least for the hardware software interface part of the design. Um, the CSR compiler is meant to be embedded in the design flow. And so the customers would check in their CSR spec files, run their make files or make equivalents to build their designs from the CSR spec golden source. And then we get their RTL and uh, documentation verification um, and verification collateral. And, um, and so in that regard, um, and the CSR spec itself has pretty com has structured strings. So you can do things like tables and bold and stuff like that. But realistically, most of our customers just use plain text to describe their registers. Um, I guess I can't say who it is, but one of the speakers in Hot Chips, uh, this show, their device had 5 million registers. And so each engineer is responsible for between 30 and 50,000 registers, and they just don't have the time to embellish the text. Just getting the text in once is, is, is a chore in itself uh, into the CSR spec file. Uh, basically the descriptions and what the bits are for and how they work. Um, and so, uh, as far as interchange goes, um, CSR compiler is also a cross compiler. So we can translate CSR spec uh, to any of the other formats, system RDL, IP exact, uh, spreadsheets. And so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a cross compiler in the linker. So we can translate from one format to the other and we can bring uh, different formats together to build a, a full chip view. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I have, I have a question. Sure. It's disappointing to hear about system RDL because I, I personally like looking at system RDL code a lot more than I like looking at XML. Yeah. Um, but what, 
I have looked at a little bit of XML and it, you know, between the, is it the 2009 to 2014 standard, you know, I, I see things just little changes, like whether it's the reset values move to the field category, I think, or so yeah. it, anyways, I'm just trying to give some context, but what I could imagine is when the IP exact standard, the next version of it comes out, could you not, kind of leverage that to help define system RDL version three, um, if there is any changes to the, the register and address mapping parts of IP exact? Yeah, um, that's, that's a, a very good comment. Um, uh, realistically, when, we, uh, when I was working on the system RDL 2.0 standard, one of, one of the main goals of that um, new standards effort was to roll back, so originally, uh, system RDL and IP exact back in 2009 were sort of neck and neck. Um, one of the features of system RDL, which was register files, was was pushed into IP exact. And I guess I, I'm the guilty party there. I was the one that moved that that concept from from system RDL to IP exact. Um, and so there's um, stuff moving, you know, features moving from one standard to the other. For IP for system RDL 2.0. Uh, we definitely put an effort into rolling into the system RDL 2.0, the, the features of uh, IP exact 2014. So we added a couple of things there that were based on, on um, the 2014 standard. Right? For instance, the, the, the 2009 version of uh, system RDL had a very limited set of software behaviors and IP exact, at least the 2014 version, it had 100, 104 different software access modes and we added all of those to, to system RDL 2.0. Um, so that, 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 what you're talking about actually does happen. Now the, the latest version of IP exact, I guess in the public forum, I can't really talk about what the community is, the features that are working on, but you know, um, access modes is something that the, the committee is looking at. And, um, uh, but I, right now at the moment, I, I don't think since uh, system RDL didn't really innovate that much in the um, in the 2.0 version. I mean, other than to incorporate some uh, uh, IP exact and UVM features, um, there really isn't anything going in to, from system RDL 2.0 into the, the current IP exact standard. Um, now, unfortunately, it seems like the standards are now diverging. Um, UVM still only has about 30 software access modes and. Now, system RDL and IP exact have, like I said, 104, 105 different access modes. And the new version of IP exact, you know, right now we're looking at uh, a new scenario where we have a lot more uh, software access modes. Um, and uh, I happen to know that the uh, UVM committee is mostly cleaning up the standard. It's not really adding any features for the, the next go around. So um, unfortunately that you'd have to wait for some of those features to propagate um, to UVM uh, a couple more years, probably. Um, I, I guess I've talked a little, rambled a little bit on, on how some of these features move back and forth. I hope I've uh, at least assured you that the, the Standards Committee tried to do that. And uh, I'm just curious if the, your favorite features are, in fact, where they need to be. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't had any issues. It was just, that's, I've, like I said, begrudgingly looked at IP exact for other reasons and, and found it very similar other than, you know, one of the, I mean, we don't need to, obviously, you know everything about these standards and I, you know, but the, the, the fact that you can, that system RDL looks a lot like, you know, C++ programming language is, you know, great when you can do hierarchy and stuff like that, whereas, IP exact XML is just, you know, it's declarative, right? And you can't really do much, uh, yeah. or at least not that I know of. Uh, right, so, right. So you don't, no human wants to read XML, basically. That's, that's correct. Uh, which, you know, I, I agree. I mean, some of the intent, most of the intent of XML was, it is human readable, but it's mostly good for machines to, to read and not have in, you know, all the different software and ECAD people can now, can, have the same language to, to talk to each other is right, how I right. understand it. 
Right. Uh, so and yeah, but I, I love to hear that cross pollination is is happening in all the different standards. You just have to pick the one to define your golden. You know, if you're if you have your golden standard, then you got to pick the one that obviously has the mo everything you need in it, which right. doesn't sound like you would. And you, and I mean, I think of UVM as an output from either IP exact or, or system RDL. So I'm, I I would never be writing my my golden copy in UVM and then expecting to get everything else out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. You, you almost sound like an advertisement for the semaphore product. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you right. want to have more information about uh, uh, semaphore and the CSR compiler and our capabilities, uh, certainly reach out to, to Josh and um, schedule a, uh, we can schedule a, uh, a longer discussion. Will do. Okay. Thank you.